stuff. Okay, so I think we're good. Um, has been an inspiration to me since the beginning, honestly. Um, I am Canadian, as many of you know, and I went to medical school in Toronto. Um, and uh, many years ago, I rotated um, at the Toronto Western um, Hospital, which is really the, the foundational hospital in neurology in the country of Canada. Um, and had the pleasure of working with Dr. Lang when I was a third year medical student many years ago and was really inspired by the amazing work that they do um, to help Parkinson's patients and uh, in the field of movement disorders. And he's just a, honestly, such a, a leader in the field and a founding father and somebody that I look up to so much and was the reason that I went into this field and have grown to love Parkinson's. And so it's been just a sheer pleasure to follow his work um, for, I think, two plus decades since that time. And uh, he continues to um, just be an advocate for patients and just a real uh, game changer in this field um, for many, many decades. Um, he continues to work at the Toronto Western Hospital um, and he is a professor of neurology um, at the University of Toronto. He's the director of the Morton and Gloria Schulman um, Movement Disorders Clinic there. Um, and he's the Jack Clark Chair for Parkinson's Disease Research, um, the Lily Saffer Chair in Movement Disorders at the U University of Toronto. And um, he's just, you know, been in every uh, aspect of the Movement Disorder Society and a real, you know, world leader in Parkinson's disease. So welcome, um, Tony. It's just a pleasure to have you. And thank you for inspiring me to go into this. And I still think I chose the right field. So um, maybe we can Definitely learn. <laughs> maybe we can learn a little bit about how you got inspired to become a movement disorder doctor, maybe why you went into medicine in the first place, why you then chose neurology and why you've, um, you know, found yourself as uh, continuing to, to, to be an, an inspirational leader in Parkinson's disease. Well, I see a lot of wide-eyed faces there and I think I'll see eyes closing as I bore them to tears, telling them the story of uh, how I got to where I, uh, I am now. So I'll, I'll give a very short version. I came into medicine by accident. I thought I was going to be a mathematician and then realized that my brain was wired very differently from real mathematicians in my first year of university. Um, I then, because I had done science in the first year, I, I took medicine by default. I had no uh, mentors or role models in medicine in my family. So it really was an accident that I decided to go into medicine. Um, when in medicine, I became very committed to cardiology and heart uh, uh, embryology and development, and I was really going to be a cardiologist. But in my uh, third year of uh, medicine as a resident, I did my training in neurology and realized how absolutely phenomenal the brain is, how complex, how interesting the patients were, how diverse and different they were in cardiology, uh, they deal with chest pain, shortness of breath, swelling of ankles, fainting, and not a whole lot more than that. Uh, whereas the neurologist deals with many, many different complaints. And often you have to be a detective. The Sherlock Holmes should have been a neurologist because you, you need to put together all of the information. And talking to patients is critical. Getting the story of the patient. If you leave the bedside not knowing what you're dealing with, uh, uh, you'll often never find out. It's, it's how you communicate and how you carefully examine the patient. You don't just rely on a, an MRI scan or some sort of investigation. So um, that's why I did neurology. It was, I was just turned on by how diverse and interesting it was. And then um, movement disorders, it was in large part a single patient. I had a mentor neurologist who brought in his... Uh, favorite, most complicated Parkinsonian patient to the uh, room with the medical students. And this man would withhold his levodopa first thing in the morning and come into the room. And as most of your audience knows, he would be stiff and shaky and slow and unable to get out of a chair. He'd take his medicine while my mentor was teaching us. And we saw this man change like turning on light switch. Uh, he went from being immobile to mobile and really able to do uh, most things that he had to do. And uh, I had never seen anything so remarkable in my entire life. That really is, as many of you know, it's not the answer to Parkinson's, but it still is pretty miraculous that a single drug is capable of doing what it does. 
And so that really was the thing that turned me on. And I went to, away to train in England uh, after that, and then came back and my mentor sent me that same patient and I became his neurologist and cared for him until he died. So there was continuity in my uh, understanding, development and interest in Parkinson's disease. That's amazing. One other thing that I think has been really fascinating that you've described is the fact that we as neurologists um, have um, been able to, because of video, change our ability to teach each other and to define some of the phenomenology. Since we are movement disorder doctors, so much of what we talk about is things like tremor and dyskinesia, so the extra movements and things. And I think you have done a tremendous job to help categorize these things and have been such a stickler, honestly, for um, teaching us in a very systematic way how to approach the exam of these patients and have still many, many years later um, consistently been uh, participating, um, which I know is a tremendous amount of work. And this will be the first year that we're taking this all, entire Movement Disorder Society conference digital um, and doing this virtually. But, um, you know, you've been, um, my favorite thing about that whole conference is the Video Olympics in which we show videos of patients from literally around the world. And we see world leaders, many of whom are on this series, um, discuss the patient and interview sometimes these patients and ask questions. And it's just such a rich experience and something that I have learned so much about. So I think um, we really, um, you know, want to learn from you about that and how it's changed. The video aspect may have changed sort of the approach. Could you speak to that for a minute or two and then we'll get into some of the slides that you're gonna teach us about. Okay. Yeah, so uh, some of your audience may not know there is a society called the Movement Disorder Society. It actually changed its name more recently to the International Parkinson and Movement Disorder Society. And this society was established to uh, publish a journal and it was the very first journal that had a video supplement. And the video supplement demonstrated the movements of patients with brain diseases that are in our field. And uh, as Indu has indicated, um, it's the accurate recognition of the type of movement that patients suffer from that allows us to categorize the problem and to come to some sort of correct diagnosis and then an appropriate therapy. Um, and it's not uh, a mistake that Parkinson's disease is lumped with all of these movement disorders. And many of you know that the medication you take for Parkinson's induces abnormal movements. And it's the recognition of the nature of those abnormal movements and how they vary from person to person will often establish how we're going to manage them. So that recognition is really quite critical. And in neurology, we typically teach students where is the lesion? What is the lesion? So you have a patient present and it's talking to the patient, as I've told you, it's examining the patient that you establish where in the brain or the nervous system the problem could lie. And then all the information allows you to say what that problem is. In movement disorders, we have an earlier step. We have to say, what is the movement disorder? And then the second and third steps, where is the lesion and what is the lesion? So. Movement disorders is a somewhat different field of neurology. And as Indo has indicated, this term phenomenology, the phenomena are what we see and how to categorize that becomes very important. Yeah, it's been, I think that was the reason that I fell in love with this field is that sort of videos and the movements and the, the categorization and, and so much of what you've taught us. So I really commend you for having organized us in that way. So without further ado, um, I know you prepared just a great set of slides. I had the pleasure of looking at them before um, this, and, and I appreciate you taking the time to, to teach us about your views on the new therapies um, for Parkinson's. Um, I, I had invited Dr. Lang to join us after Dr. Espe, so um, Alberto had come on and talked about his novel kind of concepts of um, the approach to Parkinson's and customization of treatments and things like that. And so um, he had mentioned Dr. Lang in his um, uh, series, in, in his video in the series. I, I would have some of you go back and watch that video, which is available on YouTube. And we'll link his um, talk in this talk as well um, when, we, when we put up this video um, recording. And so you can kind of see, compare and contrast. And Dr. Lang trained Dr. Espy who considers him a very you know, important mentor in, in his life as well. So, so I will um, let you, Tony, um, share slides and teach us about your um, talk. Okay, can you see that? Yes. 
All right. Um, this uh, is a shortened version of a talk that I gave at uh, the Movement Disorder Society meeting in uh, Miami in January before COVID hit and we stopped lecturing internationally uh, apart from on Zoom. Um, and uh, I was challenged with the uh, question of whether a single drug would be appropriate in trying to slow the progression of Parkinson's or not. So neuroprotection or disease modification is a concept that we would all love to realize in Parkinson's, a treatment that would change the course of the disease. And I'm gonna argue that it may be that a single drug will never be able to do that for all patients diagnosed as Parkinson's disease. Um, before going on, I have a number of disclosures. It's very important to say that this field is very, very active. And uh, I think you can be uh, comforted in the fact that there are many companies and many researchers trying to get the answers we need uh, which will hopefully slow the progression of Parkinson's. So many of the companies listed here that I'm advising are trying to develop this type of treatment. This is a slide that shows you um, many of the agents that are currently in study. So there are lots of drugs that are in what we call preclinical states in monkeys and in cells. But you see there are lots of drugs that are already in humans in phase one through phase three studies Phase one is normal volunteer, one A is normal volunteers, B is early disease involved uh, patients, phase two is early in the disease you're interested in, and phase three, three is a later stage trial hoping to uh, get to the point of marketing the drug. And you can see that there are many examples of drugs that are being developed and studied in patients with Parkinson's disease with many different mechan mechanisms of action. You don't need to know the details. And the targets are all very different here. And I'm gonna to touch on some of these targets and tell you a little bit about why they're important. But you see, in Parkinson's, we're really working very hard uh, to try to find treatment that may modify the disease. Now, what we mean by one drug versus the possibility of having to combine drugs. If we think about one drug, is it going to be a single drug that everybody would use to try to slow the progression? or maybe one drug in all, but used in combinations. So if we have multiple combinations, maybe a single drug would be part of every one of those combinations in different patients with what we call biological subtypes that I know Dr. Espe referred to in his talk. What about then the idea of multiple different drugs? And those multiple different drugs could target different pathways or mechanisms, various different reasons why cells are dying or targeting different components of the same pathway. And I'll explain what I mean by that. So a single drug or multiple drugs and different reasons for each of them. Now, one, why might a single drug not fit all patients? Well, probably the most important is the fact that we widely recognize Parkinson's disease is a very complex heterogeneous disorder. It's not the same in everybody. How is it different? How is it heterogeneous? Well, clinically, what we see in examining our patients, some have tremor, some don't have tremor, some mainly have postural instability and walking problems. So we think of different subtypes and many different features that occur in, in advance of the motor features. Do you have constipation? Did you have anxiety or depression? Did you have a sleep problem? So many different things that differ and then once you get the clinical features, some have a very slow, benign course, and others have a more rapidly progressive course. And we still don't understand why people differ so much. We also know that the pathology, what we see under the microscope when a patient donates their brain, differs from patient to patient. Most patients have what we call Lewy pathology. I'm sure the audience has heard of the Lewy body, this inclusion that uh, we now know contains, uh, especially contains the protein alpha-synuclein. But there are people that we think had Parkinson's in life who don't have any of this Lewy pathology. Very interesting. When the Lewy pathology is present, some patients have it in some areas and others lack uh, involvement of those areas. And it may spread differently. And then we now recognize 
that many people with Parkinson's disease don't just have Parkinson's, we may find other pathologies, strokes, Alzheimer's disease, other proteins deposited. So even under the microscope, we see a tremendous amount of variability or heterogeneity. We know that there are many genes that predispose to Parkinson's disease. Rarely, patients present with a single genetic disorder capable of causing Parkinson's. That's uncommon, but we do know that that occurs. We also recognize that patients have a multitude of genetic risk factors, and it may be a mixture of different genetic risk factors, plus possibly the environment that then contributes to the development of Parkinson's. So it may be many genes and many gene environmental interactions and risk factors. And then finally, heterogeneity exists, heterogeneity exists with respect to all the mechanisms or cellular pathways that might be involved in Parkinson's. And what do we mean by cellular mechanisms or pathways? Well, this is a slide that shows you various different things that go on inside the nerve cells and go wrong in the nerve cells that then can create death of nerve cells and neurodegeneration in Parkinson's. Calcium is very important to the energy and uh, metabolism of cells. Synapses are where cells talk to one another and they can be damaged. The energy producing um, part of the, the nerve cell is the mitochondria and this is dysfunctional. Proteins aggregate in cells, and one of the problems may be that we lose our, our garburator ability, the ability to get rid of damaged proteins. Your garburators may be uh, altered, and other cell death mechanisms may be triggered. And then finally, we recognize there are inflammatory factors that induce or participate in Parkinson's disease, as well as all other neurodegenerations like Alzheimer's disease, for example. Each of these mechanisms may occur independently or together to cause cell death. But then remember there's that protein that's so important to Parkinson's disease, alpha-synuclein, and we know in fact that mutations in the gene for alpha-synuclein or too much normal synuclein may trigger the pathology of Parkinson's disease. And this synuclein aggregates and is capable of inducing every one of these factors that could occur independently or secondary to alpha-synuclein. And you can see therefore this vicious cycle of these pathways triggering more synuclein, synuclein triggering more of these pathways, inducing more synuclein damage, and then triggering the death of nerve cells. So it's a very complicated, multifaceted, multifactorial system with many components to the networks and the pathways that could induce the cell death underlying Parkinson. So it's not a single problem possibly. So then we have to ask ourselves is, and I put Parkinson's disease in quotations, is this a single disorder or in fact are we dealing with multiple different diseases? Now let's separate the patients who have a single gene. The commonest gene you might have heard of is LARC2, L-R-R-K2, but I mentioned mutations in the synuclein gene as well. But Let's separate the people where the rare individuals that have monogenic forms and set them aside for now, even excluding those, could we be dealing with a single versus multiple diseases? Now, I told you Parkinson's is very, very, very heterogeneous. So how could it be a single disease if it's so different from one person to another? Well, it may be that there are multiple modifiers, the age that you get the disease, your host genetics. We all come to our illnesses with a different makeup of our genetics or the environment that we were exposed to. We know that it's not just a single type of synuclein that becomes abnormal. There may be what are called strains. I mentioned copathologies. What about comorbidities? If you had diabetes or high blood pressure or other uh, medical diseases, certainly those impact on you developing Parkinson's and may impact on the manifestations of your Parkinson's. And then just things by accident, stochastic events. So all of these reasons could account for a single disease looking so different from person to person. But maybe we're dealing with diseases, different types of Parkinson's disease that are distinct pathogenically. And that obviously has a huge impact 
for the disease modifying treatments that we're hoping to be able to develop. This is a nice cartoon that you may have seen and it's not unique to Parkinson's. It's, this is throughout medicine. The idea that we've been doing in Parkinson's, for example, in all of the clinical trials we've done so far, trying to show disease modification, we take people with early Parkinson's disease. That assumes that every one of these people have the same disease, but maybe they don't. Maybe the greens and the light blues and the dark blues are all different forms of the disease or different diseases entirely. And so we're lumping them all together, giving them a single drug and expecting them all to respond in the same way, but that's naive, it's stupid. And in fact, maybe we've missed the small proportion of people that would have benefited because you studied a large population and the majority of patients either didn't benefit or had side effects. And so we missed the small proportion that could have benefited. And so with different ways of separating these groups out by what we call stratified medicine, by taking subtypes, looking at risk profiles, looking at their demographic, socioeconomic, et cetera, hopefully taking intelligent ways of separating out these populations and then using different treatment approaches and knowing what the differences in these populations are, coming up with distinctly different therapies that would be applied to each separate subgroup much more effectively than lumping them all together. So what are the implications for treatment of this single versus multiple disease concept when we're talking about how we uh, develop drugs? Well, maybe there's a single common pathway. Even if you have multiple ways of getting there, maybe downstream, everything comes together. Remember, I mentioned that synuclein that's so important. Maybe that's just enough. Maybe everything comes together, drives the synuclein, and the last common pathway is through synuclein. And so maybe it would be enough to target that one pathway. Maybe there are sufficiently important dominant combined mechanisms. So I mentioned inflammation. Even if there are many different causes of the degeneration, if inflammation is strong enough, even if that's not the unique or only factor, if we targeted inflammation, maybe that would be sufficient to change the course of the disease or energy failure or synuclein would be two other examples. Many, uh, alternatively, many molecular distinct phenotypes would exist and they would have to be separated, for example, by some blood test or imaging method or something that would distinctly separate the green from the light blue from the dark blue. And so precision medicine would be rather critical here and it wouldn't be enough just to deal with a single uh, combined or, or um, common mechanism. So I mentioned the term precision medicine and you need to know that there are four rights that are always quoted to precision medicine. In this case, we want the right drug applied at the right time in the right dose. And most importantly, in the right patient. And what I'm arguing today is maybe it's not right drug, it's right drugs. Combine drugs at the right time and the right dose for the right patient. And this is not unique thinking to Parkinson's. In fact, Alzheimer's disease has, the field of Alzheimer's has been thinking about this for some time. We are behind the field of Alzheimer's and way behind the field of cancer. And so, uh, you see here are some papers in the mid uh, 2015, 14, 16, all arguing and developing, for example, the European Prevention of Alzheimer's Dementia Project, recognizing the need for multiple combined uh, medications. Now, what are the implications? How, what are the reasons and justifications that we can argue for? Well, we need to think about this if we're gonna develop drugs, how we're gonna study them. And that becomes very complex. It's very easy to study a single drug in a group of patients. It's much more complicated to use more than a single drug. But interestingly, the very first disease modifying trial that we did in Parkinson's is the DataTOP trial. And we studied Depranil or Selegiline, vitamin E versus placebo. So there were four arms, a patient with Depranil and vitamin E, a patient with Depranil alone, a patient with vitamin E alone, and a patient with two placebos. 
And so this was called, called a two by two factorial design. In breast cancer, this field is really much further ahead. For example, three or more drugs being used in the very famous iSpy program. Another way of looking at this uh, in drug development is the MAMS, the multi-arm, multi-stage trials that have been championed in prostate cancer in the stampede uh, approach. And this is what's meant by that. You enroll patients into four different arms, for example, three different treatments and a control, placebo arm, and you follow them. And then, for example, if you've got outcomes or side effects, here's treatment two dies. It's decided that there's no longer a reason to study that treatment, but when you make that decision, you start another arm with a, a fourth treatment. Now the control arm continues, treatment one goes to this next stopping point, treatment three stops at that point, and you start a fifth treatment. So you have patients enrolled continuously in this kind of study, and at the end of the day, you've got, after one, two, three, four, five outcome periods, a long-standing control group to compare to two different treatment arms that reached a final uh, treatment, and you've not wasted a lot of time You've optimized the number of patients you've treated, and you've really gotten your answers a lot faster with this multi-arm, multi-stage trial. This has never been done in Parkinson's disease yet, yet. Now then the other thing that we could do is combine diseases. This is already being argued in some neurodegenerative diseases, but even if Parkinson's disease is multiple diseases, multiple different biological phenotypes, we might be able to combine them if there are enough similarities. And this uses a design in medicine now, uh, clinical trial medicine called basket trials. And I'll show you an example of how we might do that in a minute. Further justification for doing this or reasons for doing this are related to disease pathogenesis. The term pathogenesis I've used several times, it basically means the mechanism, all those things that calcium, the inflammation, the energy failure. So multiple distinct biological disorders with multiple phenotypes. Could that be the mechanism? And we have to take that into account when we're designing treatments. Could there be multiple contributing biological mechanisms in a single disorder? So maybe it's all one disease, but many factors. Your energy fails, you've got some inflammation, calcium changes, etc. Or could we be dealing with distinct phenotypes. So all the same pathways accounting for unique or different molecular phenotypes. In either of these cases, if we use the single drug, it may be that that single drug may not be powerful enough. It may, be, it may have insufficient impact to slow or halt the progression if you've got many other factors contributing to cell death. So there may not be a sufficiently strong final common pathway. Maybe synergistic effects of all of these pathways are greater than individual effects, or one pathway blocked may encourage other pathways to take over and become stronger. So it could be very complicated. So again, here you've seen this cartoon before, all of these different factors could be uh, influencing the cell death. Maybe some of them are dominant, but maybe we block one and another starts to fail to a greater extent, and it may not be enough just to block a single one. And then finally, uh, targeting, uh, drugs targeting different components of a single pathway is something that I mentioned at the beginning. What do I mean by that? Well, probably the best example in this case would be synuclein. Synuclein is a normal synaptic protein. It works at this end of the cell and allows you to release dopamine and other transmitters from cell to cell. So this little red ball is synuclein. You make synuclein, through DNA and RNA, so you, you have what's called transcription and you form the protein. And then the protein starts to go wrong. It starts to aggregate, it starts to become toxic and it may sit, spread, the toxic form of synuclein, the damaged form of synuclein may spread from cell to cell. And then that damaged form may recruit the normal form and make it more abnormal. So you can imagine if we think synuclein is so important, how we might target that protein and how we might affect it with treatments. We might try to reduce its synthesis, reduce making synuclein. 
we may want to reduce the clumping or aggregation or increase the degradation or breakdown. We may want to change the propagation or spread from cell to cell or its uptake or immunize against the activity in the next cell. So the next slide, you can just look here. You don't have to know any of the details, but our field is now developing treatments for every one of these mechanisms and maybe combining different types of treatment that would alter the synthesis, the aggregation, and the spread, for example, might be a way of targeting different components of the same common pathway of synuclein. So maybe multiple drugs for the same uh, pathway would be helpful. So I don't know whether Dr. Espe mentioned this, but we ran a meeting together. He and I were the directors of a meeting that we held in Toronto uh, middle of last year. And this was a so-called knowledge gaps meeting in Parkinson's. And we argued whether we could revise our current thinking and simply make some minor adjustments in how we think about modifying disease progression and get there. Or did we have to really go back to the drawing board and completely reconstruct the way we approach disease modification? It's not enough just to do a little revision. You can't tinker. You've got to go right back to the drawing board. And I know Dr. Espe is a reconstructionist. And we've written a paper that's been published very recently that outlines this. And so the idea is every one of these circles in this Venn diagram, different colored circles, is a different form of Parkinson's disease. But you see here, the revisionist would argue that all of these different types of Parkinson's are very common. There's so much overlap that their uniqueness is mainly theoretical and the overlap dominates. And so you could see that a disease modifying treatment might be good for any of them because there is so much su or sufficient overlap. The reconstructionist would argue, no, you've got many different diseases with very little overlap. And so one drug ain't gonna cut it. One drug for all of these different types or maybe even two or three drugs. Maybe it's going to have to be one drug for this group and a different drug for this group, and we're only going to treat and manage disease modification successfully in small populations one at a time. And so this is the reconstructionist, let's tear it down, we've got to restart and do it all over. I've become a reconstrivenist. I've coined a new term, and I think we probably have good reason to think that there is sufficiently strong overlap in all of those mechanisms I've summarized today, that maybe we can target patients, even though they are uh, suffering from different diseases, there may be sufficient overlap that we can not necessarily tear it down, but we have to go into it with our eyes wide open. And this is um, the basket trial concept. Um, let's say that we have multiple different subtypes with very distinct differences between them and we would need some sort of biomarker driven trial to select Parkinson's disease type one from Parkinson's disease type six, and there's no point in combining people in this group with that group or with that group, or all of these people are sufficiently different that they, you just waste your time and in fact waste a lot of effort and money in combining all of these groups. That would, the, the reconstructionist would argue that. Well, I'm saying that maybe there's enough shared mechanisms in some patients in each of these groups that despite the fact that they're different, they have a shared mechanism. So if we put them all together in a basket, we're still gonna see enough of an effect at the end of the day to find successful disease modification. Maybe not as much as if we could only target Parkinson's disease type two in isolation, but being able to separate Parkinson's disease type two out from the others we may be years away from being able to do that. So maybe with this uh, combined or shared mechanism, we'll have sufficient um, overlap to allow us to target these patients um, without having to worry about separating them completely. So the other reason for thinking about this, and I haven't spent uh, um, much effort in talking about how we do this in, in uh, cancer, but the idea that we're going to have to combine the therapies, a single drug may not be effect, enough uh, effective, but maybe combining cocktails 
And many of you know, because you've had personal experience or you've got friends or family who have undergone chemotherapy for uh, cancer, you know it's pretty rare that they receive a single drug. It, these drugs target multiple overlapping or separate mechanisms, and that's probably what we have to do in Parkinson's. So one drug does not fit all. One drug, is it a single drug versus the same drug, but in combination with others, or all? All patients with Parkinson's disease versus all patients with a selected biological defined type of Parkinson's. So we have different definitions for almost every word in this, what turns out to be very complicated uh, title. So I hope I've not confused the audience. I hope I've shown you this is a time that we're really thinking outside the old box that started with disease modifying therapies, but we still have a long way to go, a lot to learn, but we're really challenging ourselves with interesting concepts. So I'll stop in that point and I'm happy to address any questions or uh, related to the talk or any questions that come beyond that. That's great. That was very clear. Um, I think uh, it was a great supplement to Dr. Espe's talk. Um, and I don't know if you watched Dr. Espe's talk, but he ended up um, doing a little puppet show trying to show us about alpha synuclein um, with some pillows and a blanket and things like that. It was, it was, <laughs> he ended up, he was sitting on his couch and he grabbed a few things and, and ended up sort of, uh, it, it was interesting. I, I will send you the video if you haven't seen it. It was, it was quite fascinating, but, um, but this was very, very clear. It's, it's not an easy topic to cover and um, tremendously dense amount of information. And I think you made it as clear as I think I've ever heard it, honestly. Um, and even as a, as a neurologist who um, I don't have a huge basic science background, I, I, I myself find myself sometimes overwhelmed with the information. So I think, you know, as, a, as patients and caregivers, it becomes really overwhelming. And I think sometimes, I mean, just I think out the gate, um, one possible reaction as a patient or caregiver, or even a doctor um, or healthcare provider with all of these possibilities and arrows and you know feeling like there's multiple drugs and we have to separate and do all it's like it can be very sort of as, as you said confusing but possibly you know there's a sense that how can a, a single patient out in the the world really empower themselves to make a difference if there's such complexity um so i think you know i, I don't know if you can speak to that sort of in a hopeful way um to give pa patients sort of a sense of what your thoughts are on that well, I think the first thing is that everyone needs to recognize this is not something that doctors and scientists are going to answer by themselves. And so you patients with Parkinson's are part of the team, an instrumental part of the team. Number one, participating in trials. Please avail yourselves of good clinical trials. And uh, without participation and uh, an understanding of the important contribution that you make to helping not only just you, you've got to be a little altruistic here, uh, helping others uh, in the future. Without that kind of idea and thinking, we're never going to get where we need to be. Second, um, we really take the input of patients very seriously when we design these trials. And so, for example, uh, not infrequently now, there are patients on the advisory boards for the development of trials, the development of research projects in different clinics. We have now developed a very, very active patient advisory board that I think has just been uh, wonderful in uh, advancing what we do and, and the, the input we're getting from very thoughtful individuals that live with this disease, I think is really quite uh, spectacular. So your involvement, your contribution, your commitment, uh, all uh, are very, very important. Okay, uh, that's great. Um, I think there's a bit, just looking at the chat, there's one or two um, easy questions to clarify. One is that when they're talking about these different subtypes of Parkinson's disease, um, there's been a question of whether that includes atypical Parkinson's like PSP, MSA, Lewy bodies, or is that, you know, of idiopa classic idiopathic Parkinson's disease itself? Yeah, so let's separate out all the things that at the end of the day, under the microscope would look very, very different. And those might be classified as atypical Parkinsonisms. There are many other names for them. No, all I've talked about today is what any good movement disorders neurologist would diagnose as Parkinson's disease, would follow and still be 
convinced they had Parkinson's disease rather than seeing the disease evolve in a way that clearly made the original diagnosis incorrect. Okay, that's, that makes it clear. Um, a question is, um, somebody lives in a rural remote area, um, like the nearest center of excellence, uh, six hours away. How can that type of person participate in a clinical trial? That's tough. Um, we are trying to develop um, methodologies that will allow that to happen to a certain extent. And so, uh, in fact, uh, COVID has really uh, expedited or driven the need to manage patients from a distance virtually uh, very effectively. So uh, prior to COVID, I bet none of you even heard the name Zoom, or may, most of you may not have heard of it. Uh, whereas now we live by Zoom, uh, half of our lives are stuck on this, uh, this uh, methodology. Um, so that we are developing and uh, investigators are developing methods of evaluating patients from a distance. So that may be possible. On the other hand, if you're developing an experimental therapy, depending on how experimental and how uh, risky and complicated that therapy is, it might be very, very difficult for someone six hours away from the institution to receive the treatment, to have the proper monitoring, et cetera. So for example, I saw somebody uh, flash by a question about vaccines. In fact, we are studying um, what are called monoclonal antibodies or uh, passive immunization in Parkinson's disease. These are infusions. These infusions, intravenous infusions, take several hours and they can't be done eight hours away from the institution. Um, once they become available, once they're shown to be safe, then there probably will be uh, infusion centers. But while they're being studied experimentally, unfortunately, you need to be in the center, you need to be monitored carefully. So it is, it's difficult when you live that far away. Okay, that's helpful. Um, one question, and I asked Alberto this as well, um, you know, the Alzheimer's universe has um, talked about sort of uh, models of Alzheimer's almost like a roof with multiple leaks in it and holes in the roof and sort of targeting one hole is not going to be adequate to really fixing the issue but sort of looking at multiple ways to fix the holes globally and what some of their literature has talked about is talking about lifestyle approaches and even um, sort of more holistic sort of integrative medicine approaches. Um, what's your sense of that if, if we're talking about the sort of um, you know, these lumpers and splitters or, you know, whether we need to recreate the whole paradigm or, you know, sort of go with what we have. Um, are there things that patients can do to empower themselves today that could kind of globally, in your opinion, make a difference, um, you know, for, from, from these sort of um, approaches? Yes, yeah, so um, in, the field of, yeah, in the field of Alzheimer's disease and dementia, it is very clear and maybe your audience isn't aware of this, but the incidence of dementia is falling. And in fact, it's thought that it's falling because hypertension, diabetes, and other lifestyle uh, issues are being managed more effectively. So things that add to the Alzheimer's um, include those factors that we do have control over, managing your diabetes, managing your blood pressure, and your diet and exercise, all of these things are thought now to have a big influence on brain function and probably have more of an influence on those comorbidities. Remember I was mentioning, in addition to Parkinson's, in addition to synuclein, you've got the copathologies and the comorbidities, and those clearly add to the disability and the clin clinical symptomatology of patients with Parkinson's disease. So we know, for example, that patients with Parkinson's with more cognitive difficulties, with more difficulties with walking and falling, will have a greater uh, amount of strokes in their brain if we do MRI scans, for example. And so it is the presence of these other things that add to it. Uh, and so you're right, if we can manage these things, if it's been shown a good Mediterranean diet, not concentrating on all the fats and everything, but uh, good vegetables and fruits and all the rest, have a, a definite positive impact on Parkinson's disease. Exercise is one that everyone has heard about. There are the evangelical people that believe in exercise and think that that is curing the brain and changing the underlying Parkinson's disease. 
I personally believe the evidence for that is very small. On the other hand, if you have a disease that slows you down, that impairs your ability to move and function, and you get into shape, you lose weight, you're able to move faster and you're, you're, you're fit, that is going to allow you to tolerate the ravages of Parkinson's disease much more effectively. So as a minimum, being in shape and exercise can't, can't be anything but good for Parkinson's disease, even if you don't believe that it has a positive effect on the brain. And it probably does reduce your blood pressure and do other things that's good for your heart and therefore those comorbidities are better. Okay, that's great. Um, so I wanted to just spend a couple of minutes since you've been in the field for, for you know, such a long sort of period and, and have, um, you know, contributed so much and, and many of this pendulum swing from one end to the other, even in this time that I've been in the field about, you know, um, levodopa phobias and, you know, dopamine agonists and things like that. I wanted to find out in this, at this moment, um, Tony, what's your uh, sense of um, your top um, new therapeutic uh, sort of things that are either in the pipeline or just newly released that are the most exciting to you to make a difference in this disease? Well, I think we have to um, emphasize when you're asking those kinds of questions, um, dopamine and non-dopamine. So everybody thinks about dopamine as Parkinson's, but I think most of your audience knows that it's not all about dopamine. It's not just dopamine that causes all your symptoms. But Remember what we said earlier, the discovery of dopamine replacement with levodopa really was miraculous. One of the problems with the dopamine is that the way we give it now is very unreliable. It's a very short acting drug, the levodopa. It has to go through multiple hurdles to get into the brain. You have to swallow it. It has to go down your esophagus. It sits in your stomach. You have to wait for your stomach to empty and release it to the small intestine. It's got to be absorbed in the small intestine. It's got to go through the bloodstream. It's got to get from the bloodstream to the brain. Bah, 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 bah. So this is not a very practical way of giving a nice, even kind of dopamine stimulation in the brain. And that's one of the biggest problems with uh, the way we give levodopa. So I think uh, better ways of doing that, not replacing levodopa, but giving levodopa more effectively in a long acting form uh, is something that we really need. And uh, we know that by the uh, sometimes very striking effect of infusing levodopa, which is now available in uh, duodenal infusion of levodopa, and in properly chosen candidates who spend a lot of their day in the bad off state, that can be a really impressive kind of treatment. That we think of as uh, in the group of treatments called advanced therapies. Another advanced therapy that really revolutionized Parkinson's was deep brain stimulation. And again, in appropriately chosen patients, that can be really quite striking, but it's brain surgery. And it can be very complicated and can create more problems in some patients. So if you already have some thinking and memory problems, it can worsen that. If you already have problems with stability on your feet and falls, that can worsen as well. So not everybody is a good candidate for these advanced therapies and brain surgery is certainly a best example of how in a very selected group, most often younger patients, we see striking effects, but it's not for everybody. Other, th other treatments where we really need other treatments are for the non-dopaminergic features. The um, thinking and memory problems I've already mentioned, cognitive disturbances are a real challenge the mood and uh, behavioral issues, depression, anxiety. Um, areas, another area is what we call the autonomic nervous system, the blood pressure, the bladder, uh, problems with the autonomic nervous system is very important and we need better treatment for those difficulties as well. There are a series of motor problems like the postural instability, the freezing, the falls that are often more resistant to treatment as time goes on. And those treatments uh, need to come along as well. So there are some important developments, but a lot of unmet needs that we need to see um, uh, addressed. Absolutely. We spent a lot of time talking about the non-motor symptoms in this um, forum as well. And we'll be having um, um, Alfonso Fasano, who works closely with you, talk about DBS specifically as well. So sure. we'll, we'll be covering those. Um, and um, so there's been a question about um, uh, uh, 
vitamins, since you had mentioned vitamin E and other supplements, um, are there any, uh, Tony, that you feel might be beneficial to patients or any of uh, things that, you know, you want to talk about in that arena? No, I, I tell all my patients that a one a day multiple vitamin is important. Uh, vitamin E in a uh, 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 thousand international units per day is probably very important for other reasons. Uh, Anti-cancer, inflammation, a variety of other things. I think most people probably should be taking a reasonable dose of vitamin E, but high doses of vitamin C, and, and depending on where you live, Good doses of vitamin D are appropriate for your bone health, etc. But for Parkinson's disease, there's really very little evidence that high doses of vitamins otherwise have any impact. And I don't think taking all of these supplements and spending an absolute fortune on uh, um, holistic kind of therapies, uh, really these are not proven at all. And I unfortunately see a lot of people wasting a lot of money. Okay, that sounds um, uh, reasonable as well. So. A question, there are, somebody also mentioned B12, so if that's low, absolutely. I think vitamin yeah, D. Very B12. definitely. Yeah. Actually, there is, there's no relationship between B12 and Parkinson's, but if you are B12 deficient, there are very important reasons to get B12. And so very definitely, you should be checked for that. And if it's low, you be, should be treated. Yeah, and I agree with the vitamin D as well. And, and bizarrely, even in sunny places in which I live, you know, vitamin D can be quite low. So I think checking that seems very reasonable as well. Um, so um, another question, um, in terms of uh, um, sleep, maybe we can speak about sleep as another factor that may be affecting some of these cells. What's your um, advice to patients about sleep? Well, the science of sleep is fascinating. And uh, in fact, there is reason to think that sleep is very, good sleep is very important to the way your brain, brain it's easy for me to say, isn't it? Um, the way your brain clears proteins. And so good night sleep, uh, what does your brain do when you're sleeping? I still with you? Yes, now you are. Yeah, you cut out for a second. Can you repeat that? Sorry, what do you do when you're sleeping? Sorry. So when, when you sleep, sleep has many different mechanisms. Uh, it lays down memories. So it's thought that sleep is important to the way you remember and you lay down proteins in your memory system. But there's also pretty good reason that sleep is a time when you clear abnormal proteins. And so there's a lot of interest in the role of sleep in Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative diseases. So good night's sleep, apart from just the way you feel, uh, a good night's sleep may actually be doing some good for the underlying disease. Now, there are many problems with sleep in Parkinson's disease. That is a very complicated uh, topic. There are primary sleep abnormalities in Parkinson's. So for example, what we call dream enactment behavior or rapid eye movement behavior disorder. But then there are a lot of other difficulties with sleep, difficulties getting to sleep, difficulties maintaining sleep, sometimes related to drugs, sometimes unrelated to drugs. Um, and so sleep is a, a complicated topic and one that really needs to be addressed actively by your doctors. Um, so I had read something, uh, Tony, about uh, you talking about the strength of the human spirit. And this is... Um, you know, something that I think is really important. And, and this series is under the sort of banner of holistic kind of um, approaches, not necessarily supplements and things, but just sort of thinking about the whole patient and, and, and um, sort of approaching things in a, in a little bit of a, you know, sort of more holistic way. Um, could you speak a little bit to um, maybe the mind-body connection and even um, sort of what you, you term the power of the human spirit? And we have about five minutes left. So I really want to give you an opportunity to, you know, give um, our patients some inspiration again you know if you want to talk a little bit more about advocacy um, or just you know hope because um, I think a lot of folks in this COVID time frame have been feeling isolated and kind of disconnected which is why we actually started this series um, in general um, to try to connect people through this virtual modality but you know I think you've done um, had, had such a wealth of experience and you you do speak about that um, the power of the human spirit and so I'd, I'd like to spend some time and I know there's been a lot of specifics that we won't get to and you know it's just a very hot topic um, and, and you have so much knowledge, but I think, you know, if we could just spend the last few minutes talking about this, I'd really appreciate it. 
Sure. Um, maybe two general uh, points or concepts. Um, you mentioned the term holistic. I think that um, despite the term movement disorders, and we run movement disorders clinics, and movement disorders is the field that we are committed to, um, we, a good movement disorder specialist, doesn't just deal with movement disorders. And sometimes patients, um, some time ago I had a patient that, that criticized the term, the movement disorders clinic, but failed to recognize that in fact, we were attending to every aspect of that patient's care. Uh, I think he was feeling down in the dumps, but he criticized us for not addressing the non-movement disorder features. And in fact, uh, I had helped that man through the death of his wife from cancer and dealt with his emotional instability and difficulties uh, during a very uh, hard uh, time for him. And so it's really important for your doctors in the movement disorders clinic to recognize you're not just a tremor, you're not just a walking problem and a fall, you are a whole being and we need to recognize that and need to deal with you, not just in coming with Parkinson's, but all of the so-called baggage that you bring. We all bring our own baggage to the illnesses that we suffer from. And if we don't recognize who we are as an individual, if the doctor fails to recognize that you're not just Steve or Nadine or Judy or Susan or whatever, uh, with Parkinson's, you're those people that have had a life of experiences and uh, we really bring those experiences to the way we manage the illnesses that we suffer from. We also bring those experiences to the way we help the physicians deal with the diseases themselves as well. And I mentioned the patient advisory board. Uh, it's really remarkable the wonderful expertise and uh, um, uh, underlying experiences that our patients bring to the advisory board in areas that I, I'm, an, I'm very ignorant. Uh, some of the advice that we've received from our patients because they brought their experiences, their professionalism and their uh, uh, work uh, experiences to our advisory board and have really advised us quite considerably. So it's really important for us as physicians in a field of movement disorders to know, and I hope most of you doctors do, that you're not just a movement disorder, you're a person that happens to have a thing that we call movement a movement disorder, but it's not just a movement disorder even, it's this complicated, array of symptoms that are behavior, movement, feelings, et cetera, et cetera. By the concept of the strength of the human spirit, I use this uh, term probably for the first time in accepting a, um, a chair that I currently hold in the name of a wonderful man who has since passed, uh, Jack Clark. And uh, Jack and Mary Clark raised a large amount of money for Parkinson's research at the University of Toronto. And every once in a while, I went with them to the home of a wealthy individual that they were hoping would uh, turn to philanthropy and give money to their cause. And I watched these two wonderful people walking hand in hand uh, up the stairs to the, the house that they were visiting, their interaction, their love, their dedication, uh, despite his increasing disability. And um, seeing that uh, really touched me immensely. Uh, and that's, I really saw his strength and her strength uh, overcoming uh, a tough disease that eventually took his life, uh, and, but really did uh, immense good. The, the work that they did, the people that they touched, the influence that they had, on Parkinson's research subsequently and other people's lives were really tr quite tremendous. And it was just seeing those two wonderful people working at something they believed in, they dedicated, they were dedicated to, they loved, was very, very impressive. So when I accepted the chair, I talked about Jack's uh, human spirit strength and I really meant it and uh, I was very inspired by it. That's beautiful. Well, um, I think we're at the top of the hour, Tony. This just flew by, and I really appreciate in all of the the other you know time and effort that you have to give to so many other causes, including the video Olympics and things that you're trying to arrange for the Movement Disorder Society, which I look forward to. Time. You you taking an hour out of your day and and inspiring us uh, through this really clear 
and inspirational talk. And I really, you know, feel like um, we, we really got a new understanding a little bit, at least I did, of, of this disease and, and just connecting these other dots as well around the human spirit. And so hopefully we can take that spirit and, um, you know, continue to fight the fight for this disease and work together, I think, as doctors and healthcare providers and advocacy organizations and patients and caregivers and people who care about Parkinson's to, to really make a difference. Um, so I really appreciate you taking this time. And uh, I'll hand it back to you, Andrea, um, uh, uh, to say yeah. goodbye. Thank you to both of you. Thank you, Dr. Lang. And we always share our gratitude with a goodbye wave. If you scroll through the boxes, it's just so great across the world now to, to see everyone uh, so appreciative of you sharing your time and expertise. So thank you to everyone for joining us. Thank you again to, uh, to Indu and Dr. Lang. And um, we'll hope to see you online again next week. Thank, thank you, everybody. You. Nice Bye. talk. Bye. Thank you.